Hey, are you looking for a collaborator for your next show? Maybe you're a composer looking for a lyricist or a book writer looking for a composer. We now have a writer database on the Producers Perspective Pro of 150 writers strong looking to work with you. Check it out at the ProducersPerspectivePro.com. It's the only writer database of its kind. Now on with the podcast. I want to be a producer with a hit show on Broadway. I want to be a producer. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Producers Perspective Podcast. I am Ken Davenport. My guest today is a Tony Award winning set designer, Mr. Derek McLean. Welcome, Derek. Thank you. Happy to be here. So Derek has designed a ton of Broadway shows and off-Broadway shows from Fully Committed to Noises Off, GG, Beautiful, Nice Work If You Can Get It, Follies, and so many more, uh, including he's a designer of my upcoming Get the Band Back Together, won a Tony for 33 Variations, a Drama Desk for Anything Goes, and get this, an Emmy Award for his design of the Oscars, which he's doing again this year, which we'll talk about. He's fresh off his design for Hairspray Live. I actually used his parking spot when I was interviewing Ken Leone for this podcast. So thank you very much for that parking Anytime. spot. Anytime. Thank you for being here. So let's just start off with this. What came first, your love of the theater or your love of designing stuff? My love of designing stuff. When I was a kid, I thought maybe I would become an architect. And uh, I used to sort of make little models of greenhouses. And I also used to make elaborate aquariums in my basement. The aquariums were made entirely from scratch, so the sides were made out of plywood with one plate of glass in the front. And the problem was that the plywood usually leaked. But it wasn't really about putting water in them. It was about making scenes inside these boxes. That was the, the thing that did for me. I didn't know anything about set design. I'd never even really heard of it. And I, I, worked, as, I worked construction as a summer job between high school and college, and then again during the summer breaks from college. So somebody asked me to build a set when I was in college because I had this construction experience. And I did that, And uh, but I immediately thought, wow, wouldn't it be cool to design one of these things? And so I started to do that. There was no, I went to Harvard as an undergraduate, and at the time there was no, there was no theater program, so it was completely just an extracurricular activity. And the good thing is that I got to design a lot of shows, the downside was that I had absolutely no skills. I didn't really know how to say create a piece of period architecture on stage, anything like that. Anyway, that's how I got my start. And how old were you when uh, you started designing the aquariums? I'm always curious as to oh, where yeah. your instincts come out. Gosh, I don't know, probably 12 or 13. And the first show? I'd always made things all my life. I mean, I'd always been a person who made little, you know, model airplanes and rockets and junk like that. Were you a model rocketry kid? Well, no, mean? not really. I was I was never really that into the kits. I was more into making them from scratch. I remember when I was about five or six making a rocket out of paper and leaves. And I was convinced that because you could light the leaves on fire, that the thing was going to shoot up in the air and blast off into space. And my dad, I remember my dad gently telling me that it would be okay if this rocket didn't actually take off. <laughs> And what was the first show that you designed in college that someone said, hey, will you, or will you build this for us? The first show? Well, the first thing I built was a, the musical version of Two Gentlemen of Verona. And the first thing that I designed was a production of Guys and Dolls, which was in a dining room at, at college. And it was in the corner of a dining room. And uh, I was very proud of it. And I, I, I kind of cringe now when I think about what I did. So when you said you didn't have the skills to design a set, what are those skills? What what does a set designer need to have? If I decide I'm going to do this tomorrow, what do I need to know? Well, you know, it really depends on the project. So there were certain pro certain shows that I was able to pull off without any of the sort of traditional design skills that were just completely conceptual things. Um, I did a lot of work with the director, Peter Sellers, when I was in college. Uh, a lot of those things didn't really require uh, traditional drawing skills, but... You know, in order to sort of think bigger or to think, say, you know, to be able to have ideas that were in a particular period that um, used a period of architecture or things that, you know, sort of engaged in real fantasy, that required, you know, like a, a bunch of other skills that I didn't have, like the, the ability to look at a piece of research and figure out, you know, if I wanted a, for example, a period, a really elaborate period door and I wanted to have that built on stage. I didn't know how to get from the piece of research to the thing on stage because there's, there's certain sort of skills that you know you can learn, you can be taught. But 
help you do that. Or even the, you know, the ability to figure out how to do a multi-scene musical and how to make that fit into a theater and all the kind of stuff that goes along with that. So a lot of that stuff is drawing based. And what happened when I was an undergraduate was I met, I met the designer Michael Jurgen and I told him, you know, I wanted to be a set designer professionally. And I said, what should I do? And he said, well, you should probably go to Yale. You should probably go to Yale drama school. He was on the faculty of Yale. And he looked at my portfolio, such as it was, and he said, you know, what you really, really need to do is learn to draw, to sketch, sketch well. And I was sort of surprised to hear that. Uh, and he said, you know, if you did no more, if you did, if you designed no more plays and spent all of your time between now and going to try to apply to graduate school, just drawing, you would be, you would be in much better shape. You designed plenty of plays and now you need to really learn to draw. And so I enrolled in the, some of the drawing classes. Well, the, the, I, I enrolled in the, the prerequisite drawing class that I had at Harvard, which was called Drawing 10. And it was an absolutely miserable class that insisted that you spend the first six months drawing squares and circles and uh, learning to draw them neatly, which really has nothing to do with being able to draw well or see well or any of those things. And so I ended up, I ended up taking my drawing classes at the Cambridge Center for Adult Education in the evening, where they had real art classes. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> he drops Harvard for <laughs> the local art school. Yeah, the local art school was actually, what, it was actually, those were real art classes. And um, I did, we did life drawing, and they had, some, you know, they had good instructors there. And so I, I did that pretty pretty intensively uh, until the time I didn't apply to Yale. And then when I applied to Yale, Ming Cho Lee was the head of the program there. He still is. And Ming Cho Lee looked at my portfolio, and he said, well, he said, if you promise to keep studying drawing from now until September, we will accept you. <laughs> so, who, I had no idea that the actual sketching was such an important part of the design. I always thought you guys were sitting down at an architecture drawing board and measuring it out with rulers and all sorts of things. Well, that's certainly a part of it. And that's a part of it that, you know, I can have an associate do. But the, the actual sketching is really valuable in, in a bunch of ways. It's, you know, it's a little bit like, writing is to a writer it's 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 sort of a basic tool so when i sit in a meeting with a director there's always a pad of paper and a pencil or a pen and i sketch during the meeting and those sketches are not necessarily beautiful they're not presentation sketches but they're they are are a part of the dialogue they're a part of the conversation well what if it looked like this or what if we did a thing that was like this or you know oh but what if it was like this and the ability to to communicate that way is hugely hugely important. So just sort of as a way of basically developing basic ideas, it's really it's really really important. And then further to that, it's really useful for me, and I think for a lot of designers, in terms of your own process when you are trying to work out a design and you're trying to figure out what you want it to look like. Sometimes you sometimes you read a play and you imagine exactly what it should look like, and you go, I know what this is going to be. But that doesn't happen all the time. And there are plenty of times when you start on a project and you read it and you go, I don't know what the hell this should be. Or you, you, you read the play and you, and you understand what it, what the playwright has described, but it's not, you know, it's, it might seem sort of overly literal or uninspired and you just sort of did that and you, you, know, you want to try to take it to the next level. And the way you do that is by drawing it. You know, I always find that if I'm working on a project that I don't know what to do, and I'm stuck, and there's always a deadline looming at some point. The, the first thing I do is I just sit down with some paper, and I just draw whatever it is the play seems to demand. So if it's a plane or room, I just, you know, figure out what the, the description is. Maybe there is a written description by the play, right? And I literally just draw that onto a piece of paper. And it's usually, this is usually a painful process for me, because it looks terrible. It's, it looks like nothing. But then you look at it, and you go, well, how do I make that better? And then you draw it again. And then you draw it again and you realize something else and you go, well, what if I did that? And you draw it a third time. And then, you know, and none of those drawings might be anything you ever showed anybody else, but they are the product, part of the process of developing a design. That's sort of the craft of building a design, especially when you don't have a sudden inspiration. You know, I think it's, it's, it's false to think that inspiration strikes and saves the day every single time. Well, a lot of times you just have to roll up your sleeves and do the work. And the drawing is what helps you do that work. It's what lets you do that work. So I love this idea that you sit down with the director and just sketch and free associate as, as you meet. Is it challenging sometimes for you? How, or how many times does an author or director come to you and be like, 
Derek, I want you to design my show. I know exactly what it should look like. Here, do this. Do you find that happens a lot? Can you work that way? What's that process like for you? I have found that happens sometimes. And if if it's a good idea and it works, I'm all for it. There's no reason not to do it. What happens when it's a bad idea? Well, usually you find that out when you when you start to execute it, you know. So, you know, if something is a bad idea, you might you might just talk about it and talk about, you know, whether that would really work. Well, you might just try drawing it and say, look at it and go, hmm, not really working so great. But then you can also draw something that might work better. It really depends. You know, sometimes there, there are lots of directors who come with ideas, and sometimes they end up being the ideas that are on, some, uh, on stage, or sometimes they develop into something else, or sometimes they're the, sometimes they're the genesis for the next idea. That really it completely depends on the, on the, on the project. I, I love how you're a, I'm going to show you what it's going to look like, or work it out, or I'm going to draw it, I'm going to do something about it. And writers, actually writers, I think, are, have a more difficult time sometimes. Oh, I'm going to try this, I'm going to try this. Uh, that, that process getting, uh, really gets the idea out there for sure. You know, I heard, um, uh, B.F. Skinner speak, the behavioral psychologist, when I was in college, and he, he gave a talk on writing, which I went to. And he said, so the big challenge for every writer is how do you get started? You know, how do you, how do you make yourself write? And what if I have nothing to say? Or what if I don't have, can't make good sentences? And his, his belief was it didn't matter that you just wrote every, anyway. And you just, even if you wrote badly, you wrote because the process of writing caused you to write better. And, you know, because he was a behavioral psychologist, he believed in writing in the same time, at the same time every day in the same room. So he had a place that was just for writing, not for anything else. And he would write, he liked to write quite early. I think he said he would start at 4.30 in the morning, something like that, and write from 4.30 to 9 every day. And he said the thing that happened for him was that by doing it regularly in the same room, he became faster and faster at getting started. That there was something about the stimulus of walking into that room at that particular hour that caused him to start writing. So I always think of that, and I think, well, you know, a lot of the same things can apply to, to drawing, and it's... To, say, to sit there and say you don't have any ideas or it all sucks is self-indulgent, really. I mean, that might be true, but, you know, at the end of the day, you just have to roll up your sleeves and do it. What's the most misunderstood thing about designing a set that the average lay person would be surprised to hear? You know, I think a lot of, a lot of people don't realize how many choices are made in design. You know, for example... You know, they don't, they don't necessarily understand how even choices about how the audience is seated is often part of the set design. Sometimes designers move the seats around, they move the audience around different parts of the theater. I think a lot of times the audience assumes, especially in musicals, that a lot of the stuff, the apparatus is, was sort of there as a part, a part of the theater. I've heard that from a lot of people, you know, when I give them tours of, of sets from musicals and I'm explaining, for example, what the show deck is, or if I'm saying, you know, explaining how we put this turntable in, they go, oh, really? I thought the tur- I just assumed the turntable came with the theater. There was always a turntable here. <laughs> and I think people are surprised to learn how incredibly bare bones, you know this because you've been in a million empty theaters, how there's nothing there when you go in, when there's not a show there. It is absolutely stripped, stripped bare. And so that everything that goes on stage is part of that, part of that design. You talk about audiences being seated or moving the seats around. Do you think, and we we have an example of that on Broadway this year right. with Natasha Pierre, do you see this as a trend? Is there going to be more of that in Broadway houses, do you think? Probably. I mean, it's not, you know, I, I probably these things go in cycles. It was also big in the 70s. What was it? Candide, I think, was, was you know, famous for this. But there were a lot of very environmental productions that were that were mounted in the 70s. And a lot of theaters started to be built in the 70s that were flexible. So, you know, not Broadway theaters, but other theaters where you could, move, you know, it was deliberately built without fixed seating so that you could, you could move them around. But I, right now there's definitely an interest in environmental productions and experiential productions, less so on Broadway than, than elsewhere. But, you know, those productions elsewhere have an influence on what happens on Broadway for sure, like Natasha Pierre, which started, you know, in a tent. And the results of that sort of experiment wound up on, on Broadway, but I think that I think that there probably will be more of that. Some of the biggest hits that Broadway has ever produced are these giant spectacles, Phantom of the Opera, Lion King, Wicked, etc. Do you think Broadway shows have to be big? Is there a certain level that they size that they have to be to 
be successful for a commercial audience? I don't think so. I think if you looked at, say, Jersey Boys, which had a really long, successful run, that was a very, very simple production. It had production and it had, you know, there were things that moved, but it wasn't, it wasn't a, a sort of physical extravaganza. It was about, you know, it was about those four guys, really. I mean, um, it felt like a, a kind of real storytelling event on stage. I think Hamilton is another example. All designed. It's all beautifully designed, but it is extremely simple. It's, it, I don't, I don't think people think of that as an extravagant physical production. So I think the, I think Broadway embraces the kind of full spectrum of, of experiences, like the ones you described, which really are, you know, extravagances and big expensive productions to things that are much, they're much simpler, much simpler productions. You work a lot on Broadway and a lot off Broadway as well. Yeah. If you could only work in one of those environments for the rest of your career, and they both paid the same. Uh huh. Which would you choose, and why? I just say. Uh, I mean, certainly there's more experimentation off Broadway, but I do like the you know the aside from the fact that it pays better. I, the other thing I like about Broadway is that more people see it and. Off Broadway is limited in that, you know, in that way. That you know, even the successful Off Broadway shows are going to be seen by probably 200 people, maybe 300 people a night. So it's it's just a different scale, it's a different scale of work. I do like, you know, I mean, what we do is public, it's public storytelling, and we do like other people to share in it. And there is some, there is something satisfying about about knowing that a lot of people have seen it, but a lot of people have shared in it. What attracts you to a project? You're an unbelievably in-demand designer. How do you choose which show to do? Is it based on what you can do with the set? You're like, oh man, I can, I can design one heck of a set for this thing, even though the show is like, meh, I don't know how good the show is, or is it show based? It's more show based and more, it's more relationship based. I mean, there are certain directors that I work with a lot and, you know, I want to do all of their projects. And that, so that sometimes includes projects that are more successful and projects that are less successful. And that's just, you know, it's part of a roller coaster ride. But if I, you know, if I had to choose between two projects that, you know, one I thought had a spectacular set versus, you know, the other, which I thought was, was a really, really good show, I'd probably choose the thing that was a really, really good show because nobody really ultimately wants to see a bad show. You said there are certain directors you want to do all their projects. What makes one of those a director one of those people? Oh, I think it's just you know it's kind of a level of mutual trust that you know we enjoy we enjoy an experiment we we enjoy trying something on a show seeing how that comes out and you know have the ability to build on that and go we tried we tried this idea on this show and that was interesting and but what if we tried you know what if we tried something completely completely different on uh, on something else. It's a lot easier to make bold choices, you know, with people that trust you than, than it is with people you've never worked with before because there's always a level of gamble and risk to those things. Biggest change you've seen in designing sets in the last 20 years? Well, this goes back to your earlier question. I think that there is, in some ways, that there's a movement towards simpler productions in the commercial theater. I think that there's there's been more of an embrace of commercial projects that are very, very simple. I don't know, that probably came, came about partly because of the economics. So, you know, it's not really possible to spend $2 million on every set for, for every musical. There's some shows that just aren't built that way. So I guess, I, I guess I'd say that's, that's definitely a trend. I think, you know, the style of what people want to see right now has changed also. It used to be, you know, there were so many shows that were very heavily period. There were like, there was obviously a lot of in the 80s, there were a lot of really heavily period musicals, and I think those are they're, they're less they're less in vogue now. They're so they're certainly still period musicals, but they're not. I don't think they're done with such a heavy with, with such a sort of heavy literal sense of, of, a, of a period. Where do you see set design going? Where do you see it? What do you see it looking like in 20 years from now? Big spectacles again, minimalistic, all projections. I, you know, I kind of doubt it will be all projections. I mean, people have done. We've already had experiments with all projections, and we'll probably will have more of them. But at the end of the day, you know, projections are just pictures. They're not necessarily the projections by themselves are not really a great environment for actors usually because they are just pictures. So uh, I think there's always going to be I think there's always going to be a need and a desire for that human connection that you get with real textured spaces. Not real, but textured spaces that are places that that actors can touch and respond to. But where will it go? I don't know. I don't know. 
You've done a lot of work on television. You've done the Oscars. You just did Hairspray. What's the difference between designing a set that an audience is going to see in 3D and see those textures versus one that's going to be on a screen and flat? You know, the, the difference, I guess, for de- designing, say, a musical for television or film, as a designer, you don't really control what the audience is going to see to the same to the same degree. You know, on Broadway, uh, a Broadway stage or an off Broadway stage, basically, you know, most of the audience is seeing the set from one particular point of view, and that's known. You know, on TV, the the, the audience's view is is constantly moving, it's, and you're seeing it from a lot of different angles, and you're seeing it from, from far away and up close. So it has to it has to have a whole other level of detail. In some cases, like in the case of the hairspray that I just did. Because the the camera moves so much, and it moved from set to set, and it moved in and out of the sets, and it, you know there's so much that was done with steady cam that would that would would rotate 360 degrees around. It wasn't so much about designing a picture. You know, on Broadway, often you're designing a, you know a kind of a composed picture that where you compose in the sense that a painting is composed. Something like that in television, like in the hairspray that I was just describing, you're really envi- designing more of an environment. That, that the piece can live in and that the, so that the camera can go wherever it wants. The process by which sets are built on Broadway, so we go through this process where you design it, you give it to the general manager, give it to the shops, they bid it out, it mm-hmm. goes back and forth. What do you think of this process? <laughs> well, it's, I guess that's a sort of necessary evil for a lot of productions. It's, I mean, it works fine a lot of the time, but... You know, what would be ideal is if there's enough time that the designer and director and producers would sort of be able to look at the design and figure it out, figure out what it is, what it is they want to do and how they want to do it so that they're not sort of under the time crunch of getting bids back and getting a show awarded to the shop. You know, there, there, there's a thing that happens on some productions where, you know, by the time you get prices back, and you're trying to sort of reconcile the costs of the set and the and the budget. You're, you're up against the you're up against the calendar. Um, it gives you very very little time to to make good decisions. And I think that's you know the thing that's the thing that's most frustrating for me and pretty frustrating for a lot of directors is when your back is up against the wall. It's probably frustrating for producers too. You know you're 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 faced with a situation where your back is up against the wall because of the calendar. And you don't have time to go back and make new creative choices. You just have to figure out, you know, what to cut in order to get the show on budget. And I don't think anybody usually enjoys that very much. No, uh, from a producer's perspective, if you will, we hate to cut stuff. Right. I mean, no one wants to cut stuff. And right. we often find ourselves in these awkward, and you're right, time pressure situations. Like, we have to, we have to do it by tomorrow. Right, exactly. <laughs> And it sometimes feels like I'm even telling designers, because you don't have time to rethink it, right? Mm-hmm. You just, it's like cutting off a hand because it's gangrenous or right. something. It's like, right. it's an unfortunate thing. What's the favorite design that you've seen of a show that you haven't designed? Something you've seen where you're like, that's good. <laughs> well, there are lots of them. There's always a couple of every season that, that make me feel that way. It can be from way back to anything that's... Yeah, I mean, one of my favorites ever was the set for Carousel that Bob Crowley did at uh, Lincoln Center. I thought that was beautiful, beautiful, magical production. It was, you know, theatrical and transported and surprising. Your favorite set of your own? In other words, if yeah. the Smithsonian Institute called and said, we've got room for one of your models at our institute, which one would you choose? Boy, that's hard. I'm always changing my mind about that, but... I guess I'd have to say probably either three, 33 variations or I am my own life, one of those two. Uh, they're both, that, that's how both of those are really strong. I don't agree with you on that. Both of them <laughs> are exceptional. I am my own wife was amazing. Thank you. Like. My last question, another James Lipton like genie question. I want you to imagine that the genie from Aladdin comes to visit you uh-huh. and wants to thank you for your incredible contributions to the theater as a designer and says, What's the one thing that drives you crazy, Derek? What makes you bang the table, flip your drawing table up in the air, get really angry that you've asked this genie to wish away in an instant about this industry? One thing makes you mad. The one thing that makes me, the one thing that makes me mad. You know, I guess the, the thing that makes me maddest is, is, is when I've worked on a show that, you know, I and the other collaborators, you know, really works and it can't find an audience. That's incredibly frustrating. And it happens sometimes. 
it just, for whatever reason, doesn't catch on with the public. And that's, that's a frustration. And I don't think I'm probably alone in, in being frustrated by that. You're definitely not alone. Cause I'm right there with you. What do you do when that happens? How do you? Well, I, as a designer, there's really nothing I can do except, I, I suppose, try to get as many people that I care about to see it before it disappears. Uh, because, you know, what we do as ephemeral doesn't last forever and it's really only there in the moment. So, there's something that I do feel is special that's not going to last when I I want the people I care about to see it. Well, thank you for that. We'll, we'll try to see what we can do with the genie to get that, that <laughs> wished away. Okay, if all good. shows will be successful, then all the theaters that's will right. be filled and we'll never be able to do anything new. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for being here. Thanks to all of you for listening. Good luck with the Oscars. We'll all be watching. See you next time, guys. Bye-bye. Don't forget to check out the writer database on theproducersperspectivepro.com. 150 writers just waiting to work with you. Check it out at theproducersperspectivepro.com today.